Great. Good evening, everyone. It's six o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, before I hand it over to Dr. Bauer, I'm just going to go through a couple of housekeeping items for everyone to keep in mind tonight. Um, so thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a level two CME, tried, true, and new in adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, we do want to let you know that the presentation is being recorded and will be reposted on our YouTube channel. Um, we will send a link out to everyone who registered and attended this evening so that you can rewatch or share with colleagues if that's something that you're interested in. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, you can do that one of two ways. You can either um, type them into the chat. We will be keeping an eye on that and can um, ask them to Dr. Bauer on your behalf. Or if you prefer, um, you can raise your hand. There's a button up, if you're not familiar with Teams on the top menu, um, it's a picture of a hand and it says raise. If you raise your hand, we can go ahead and unmute you and you can ask your question yourself if you'd like. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will be putting a link in the chat for the evaluation. We very much appreciate any feedback you can provide so that we can continue to bring you content that is val valuable to our referring provider community. I'll also be sending out an email tomorrow morning with that link in case you have to hop off early today. And in the next couple of weeks, once the recording is posted, we will be sending that out as well. With all of that out of the way, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Bauer. So Dr. Jennifer Bauer attended Brown University for undergrad and Case Western Reserve University for a dual medical and master's of anatomy degree. She completed her residency at Vanderbilt Medical Center and spent a year in pediatric orthopedic fellowship at Nemours Al DuPont Hospital for Children, where her time was focused on care of the pediatric spine. Her elective practice at Seattle Children's is entirely devoted to spine care, treating patients of all ages and conditions from common to rare and complex. She holds several leadership positions at the hospital, including spine division leader and medical director of the surgical unit. As a member of the University of Washington orthopedic faculty, she is committed to mentoring med students, residents, and fellows to become the next surgeon leaders. She also serves as invited faculty for national and international educational courses. Dr. Bauer continues to dedicate time to orthopedic research and improve, to improve the field of spinal deformity and pediatric fractures and often presents her work at national and international conferences. She is a committee member of pediatric spine societies and study groups and has earned several traveling fellowships and is an editor and reviewer for scientific journals. Outside of the hospital, she enjoys most water and outdoor activities, including wake surfing, cycling, and skiing. And we are very lucky to have her um, be faculty and uh, an attending position here at Seattle Children's. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Bauer. Awesome. Thanks so much, Erin. Everybody's got me okay. You can see my slides and hear me well. Uh, thanks so much also to everybody who's joining. Great turnout. Um, I know this isn't you know, this is family time and, and other time, personal time. So thanks for taking time to be here. Hopefully then we can make this as worthwhile as possible for the time that you're spending here. Uh, I have a couple sections to go over with some um, natural stop points between them. Um, and so we'll uh, give uh, opportunity to, for questions, but if something you're dying to ask in the middle of it, please do. And we'll have some time at the end as well. So uh, this is a talk on AIS because I think that's the most common thing that you guys see. It's actually um, probably about only 40 or 50 percent of the surgeries that I do here. So we do a lot of other um, varied spine surgeries, but a lot of what we do even before we get to the surgery is also with AIS because it's just the most common um, scoliosis that we see. So uh, I want to review some of these basics here and then figure out if there's anything new about them or um, if um, they are not no longer true or if there's something is new about them. So we'll, we'll work through all of these. So uh, first thing really is that any patient that comes in to see you with a spine um, should have an exam of the spine. And, um, you know, uh, the usual thought is let's get an x-ray before referral. So what does that look like? That looks like an Adams forward bend test, which you guys are all probably very uh, familiar with, uh, and doing a scoliometer first before radiographs. From various studies, we think that maybe five degrees relates to a 20 degree cob, or maybe seven degrees does. 
uh, based on which studies you show, if you um, do this on all children in the population and you use five degrees as the cutoff, then 12% of all of the children will be referred. If you use 7%, then 3% will be referred. So uh, studies talk about making a delineation between those two, but the statement from Pediatric Orthopedic Society, Scoliosis Research Society, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeries, which is all of our societies that deal with this, is anywhere between five to seven that that maybe that should be what you, that should be considered a positive screen and you should get uh, x-rays. But we know that that's only part of this part of the story. Some newer study shows that maybe these aren't as reliable as they think, particularly with different body habitus. So the larger the body habitus, the um, smaller the degree of a scoliometer will be considered a positive screen. So there's a little bit more complication to that. Now things are maybe getting streamlined, but also maybe more complicated. There's now 16 plus studies of trying to use your smartphone for this. It works much better. The studies show if you actually have a straight edge underneath it so that it can be a longer um, lever arm to actually measure that. So uh, people have been looking at that. But from those studies, um, we're finding that maybe we're not quite as reliable at doing these uh, scoliometers. Still a very good judge, very good guide, something to start with. If it's really high, then um, the odds are uh, that it's going to correlate to the cob. The problem is, are we going to catch them early enough? Um, and so then the question becomes, well, should we do x-rays on all these people before we send them or before we refer them to a spine specialist? Uh, this is uh, probably the newest study that discusses this. How useful is the pre-referral pediatric spine imaging? Unfortunately, when we look at all of the patients that come new to an orthopedic clinic and the ones that have radiographs, how adequate were they um, at the time to actually assess what the patient needs? And only um, about 20% of them were adequate. 80% need repeat imaging. Uh, and half of, or a quarter of them, the initial cob was off by five degrees, which was enough for 14% of them to be wrong on what we would have otherwise treated them, whether they needed a brace or not. So 14% that we initially, if we went by the first cob, um, that it was too small, uh, it was measured small, and so you wouldn't have given a brace for it, and really it should have been given uh, a brace. The problem comes when um, uh, we have stitching that doesn't line up. I've seen 15 degrees different of stitching, even though what you're going to read on the report is a certain number. It's so important uh, for you to, if you're going to rely on those radiographs, to really be the one to measure them yourself. And and that doesn't have to be in anybody's wheelhouse. It's, it's in our wheelhouse. And so we're happy to do it and see these kids and um, get the right x-rays. This is an example of uh, Thursday. Um, just this past Thursday, my last clinic, I pulled this x-ray. A uh, patient presented to me with this x-ray, 31 degrees. Um, I can measure it as as such. The radiology read was something different. Um, this 31 degree curve could mean they need a brace, or it could mean that they're done growing and so it doesn't matter and it's a 31 degrees and, and we just keep watching it. But we don't know because we don't have any um, iliac crest, apophysis, nothing else to go on. So uh, understandably so, a lot of these radiology centers want to limit the radiation that these patients are getting, but for a spine scoliosis film, there's really a number of things that we need. And we also need to see the lateral because if the lateral has kyphosis in it, then I'm going to measure an MRI because this patient shouldn't have, I'm going to order an MRI because this patient, if it's idiopathic scoliosis, shouldn't have kyphosis. It's a three-dimensional problem in the spine. They're going to get scoliosis, they should get hypokyphosis in the thoracic spine, um, and they're going to have rotation. If all three of those things aren't there, then that patient needs an MRI to figure out why they have a curve if it's not idiopathic. And with just one film that doesn't include the right things, uh, we, we can't make that determination. So this patient, although she came with this x-ray, she's going to get two more x-rays when she comes to my clinic, which is uh, what she did on Thursday, um, which is unfortunate. Fortunately for her, we found out that um, this curve was um, uh, in a skeletal, fairly skeletally mature. So um, we're going to watch that. Which brings us to our next topic of, all right, well, when do we brace? Very uh, standard indications here for reading the textbook. Cobb, 25 to 40 degrees, risor zero, one or two. So you got to see the risor sign. We're not going to brace 
for patients that have any respiratory, major respiratory issues. If they have severe lordosis, so again, we know that they lose their kyphosis and they go into lordosis, but if it's severely lordotic, then you really can't get a, a hold of that curve correctly. If the curve is rigid and over 40 degrees, they're probably not gonna tolerate a curve, uh, a brace very well. And if the apex is at uh, or above T8, I'll definitely push that to seven or six and really talk and work with our orthotists and see if there's any way we can hold this curve knowing that the mold is going to be a little low, but what can we do for it just to try to get them into something, but a high apex, we're really not going to be able to hold them very well. And what again is our purpose of our brace? Prevent progression, prevent the need for surgery, but a uh, standard dogma is that this does not improve the curve. It improves it while they're in the brace, they take out the brace, the brace effect goes away, we take an x-ray. Our hope is that it just remains the same. Um, but maybe that's not true. Uh, this isn't even in uh, published yet, but it's, it's going around on, um, uh, on our conference circuit right now, making the rounds. New study out of Columbia, where they looked at small curves in young children and found that idiopathic, uh, and they found that, so this could be even eight, nine-year-olds, they found that they could actually correct the curve long-term in these patients, or at least improve it, maybe not correct it, but improve it to a point where the curve got smaller in a brace. And these are patients that have curves less than 25. So patients that you would normally not think to brace. So because of this paper, it has caused me to really discuss bracing starting even at 15 degrees if this curve is flexible on my hands, on an exam, I weigh what their rotation is, talk to the family, talks about the relative uh, likelihood of this patient wearing a brace and tolerating it and how long that's gonna be for their life um, if we're starting it really early. But if we can make a curve better, um, then, then it might be worth it to the family, it might be worth it to the patient, might be worth it to us. Now, these are 15 degrees, which if we're waiting until the scoliometer is seven, uh, we might be missing these. So as things start to change, we just have to start to um, reevaluate how we're thinking about all these patients. And uh, whereas before, there's really nothing we would do, so it's okay if it's a three, four scoliometer. But now maybe that's something that we want to see here. We want to really examine it, look at the rotation, look at the flexibility, and have these conversations with the families. This is the um, you know hallmark paper, the braced study out of Iowa that talks about bracing and how long you should be wearing a brace for these Boston type TLSO braces. So our recommendation is really 18 hours a day. So that's pretty standard tried and true. Uh, it was a very good study that was actually aborted early because it was so obvious that um, how important braces were to patients and it was actually detrimental to not be wearing a brace. But do we really have to be wearing them 18 hours? Uh, it's it's unclear, maybe if we use a different brace type, we don't have to wear them eight hours and, and or, or 18 hours. And is the Boston type brace really the best brace? One of the newer braces that you guys probably have heard about, patients come and asking about, is this Rigo Cheneau or Wood Rigo Cheneau, so WRC brace or an RC brace, um, which deals with, uh, tries to affect the rotation a bit more. This is the only head-to-head -head study. So this is the study where a lot that a lot of got a lot of people talking from 2017 um, that is uh, comparing only 13 Rigo Cheneau to 95 Boston braces. And from this, it was determined that there was a few degrees less uh, progression each year with a Rigo Cheneau brace versus a Boston brace. So now the, there's some thought that patients should be in Rigo Cheneau braces. We do make them here and other orthotists around the area do make Rigo Cheneau braces, um, but it's all based on the study and it's a retrospective study. Uh, so that means that certain patients were given these RC braces instead of Boston for a reason. And some of those reasons, it takes a lot of time to um, educate a family about some of these parents and families come in very well read and, and wanting this brace because of these important studies that have been done. Uh, but 
the sagittal profile really matters uh, and what that sagittal profile looks like as to whether or not these curves are going to progress or not. And we also know that uh, curves that have a high lanky two aspect to that, which means that they have a high thoracic curve, so a big curve to the right of the thoracic spine, but also a high left one usually. Um, if you push on the right side, it makes that high left side worse, even, even more so in a Rigo Chanel brace because it really pushes up um, that arm and makes it worse. Uh, so although we make uh, Rico Chanel braces, we there aren't aren't all all curves aren't best treated in a Rico Chanel brace. So um, you know there's there's still some nuance to this, but it's something that we're definitely uh, discussing and working on. So that's along the newish newish pathway. This gives a little bit more delineation of uh, what that data actually looks like of how many patients progressed while wearing their brace, meaning that line went up, how many more degrees, how many patients their curves got smaller while wearing the brace. Um, and the orange lines or the brown lines are the Boston braces and the blue lines are the Rigo Chanel. And you can see a lot of this data is really affected by this one patient that got 20 degrees better um, wearing this brace which uh seems to be a bit of a, an outlier and hard to hard to understand but still this is important data and uh, we need more research and this might be a better brace and it's one that we're um, certainly using for certain patients what about nighttime braces uh we've long thought that if this braced study said that you need a brace for 18 hours a day how could you possibly be wearing a nighttime brace just for eight hours and have this actually matter um, there are a number of studies that have compared these there's this meta-analysis but really from the meta-analysis we see we really need random controlled trials to compare the two the thought being that a nighttime brace isn't just a boston brace worn at night it's a brace that overbends, of course and so maybe that beyond straight time for eight to 10 hours would be enough uh, compared to the eight time, eight, 18 hour Boston type brace. Um, so we are actually looking at this. There's a four center, uh, large national grant supported study to look at this uh, and to truly randomize it. Um, and we've done a number of studies already to get us there to talk about where we surveyed families and really designed a great study. Um, and now uh, we're going into actually recruiting for the study itself. So this is gonna be really interesting and I'm excited about this because it's not easy to wear a brace, I get it. There's so many social pressures going on. These teenagers have such a hard life these days. Um, we, you know, we, we screen for suicide screen, I'm sure you guys do as well. And this pediatric teenage girl uh, population of AIS that we see a lot, it's very challenging. Um, so. If we can get to the point where we can make really good nighttime braces and they're just as good, well, that's gonna really hopefully affect a lot of patients' lives for the better, uh, but we, we need to look at it more. And then how about when we stop the brace? Um, tried, and, tried and true is that we can stop it at Sanders 7. So RISR is not as reliable as Sanders score. Um, we will take x-rays of the hand here to make sure we are uh, following their skeletal maturity accurately when it comes time to starting braces, stopping braces, and a couple other things. Um, and that means that that we have um, these growth plates closed. So the growth plates close from the tips of the finger proximal, so, or, so from distal to proximal. And so once the rest of the hand is closed, typical thought was we can stop the brace. Uh, and again, our, our goal here is to keep this curve you know, less than 35 degrees until we're done growing. And if we get there, then we won't have a problem. Now we know it's more like 7B, um, which means that not only do the metatarsal heads have to be closed, but the ulna, uh, the distal ulna needs to be closed or closing or close to close um, in order for us to stop a brace. So we're pushing it a little bit further here with the duration to wear braces to try to help prevent uh, a rebound effect. Uh, in these kids. And uh, this is probably the scariest slide that I'll present to you because um, the whole plan of let's get them to the point of these curves being, you know, sure less than 50, but 40 to 50 was always a bit of a gray zone in the size. So, you know, less than 35 to 40. If we can get them there to when they're done growing, we're good, no problems, go live your life and you won't have any um, progression or need for any surgery. Unfortunately, um, we just really never had any great 
really great long-term studies um, of patients that weren't 50 degrees, patients that had smaller curves. And so this is a really great paper. Um, it was presented as an um, abstract um, just last year, and now this is one paper that is published out of it, but there's another one coming. One is just health-related quality of life. The next one coming is the progression of the curve. And um, out of uh, Denmark, which is uh, easier, or they're much better at doing these long-term studies, so 40-year follow-up, they looked at uh, 104 patients, 70 of them didn't get surgery. And so of those patients, if their curve was less than 30 degrees, over the course of that time, they averaged 10 degrees of progression. So pretty good if we can get in there. The 30 to 50 degree range progressed the same amount as the curves over 50 degrees. Uh, so that's certainly concerning to us. Now, a 30 degree that becomes a 50 degree curve over 40 degrees and that we're probably okay we're still you know they're going to function pretty well maybe not need um uh, a surgery this did show that their health related quality of life was worse their self-image was worse um a 50 degree curve progressing the same amount to 70 70 may have much more effect on their uh, health related quality of life their activity um uh, than a 50 degree curve and also that's when we think the 70 degree curve is that's when we think that we start to get some pulmonary function change. So um, does this mean that we should be doing something for 30 degree curves? Certainly not um, in teenagers, but it, it really changes how we're gonna counsel them and talk to them about what their back and their life looks like, the importance of lifelong health, staying fit and healthy, uh, keeping a strong core, finding something to be active, taking vitamin D, um, you know, anything we can to help keep their bones strong and, and healthy throughout um, their early adulthood is going to be really important for these people, much more so than I think we we previously thought and counseled as, as the surgeons, at least. I'm just going to pause for a minute. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see, I think I figured out how to look at the Q&A and I don't see any, so... I don't see any hands raised. Yeah, there's none in the chat and no okay. hands are raised, so. All right, we'll, uh, we'll keep, keep the move on here then. So again, keeping with this theme of tried, true, and new, tried and true, we're gonna fuse when a curve is over 50 degrees because that curve is gonna keep getting bigger by about a degree a year. Uh, and when a patient then becomes um, you know, 30 with a curve of 70 degrees, it's gonna affect their breathing uh, and and continue to get even bigger and the surgery for them later on in life is going to be very different. We know that if you wait even 10 years to have the surgery, same surgery, we know the complication rates are twice as high, the uh, length of stay is much longer, the blood loss is much longer, the um, uh, the, the uh, time off of work or school is much longer. So, uh, you know, it behooves you to, to treat it um, if you think you're going to treat it. So 14-year-old girl, very classic, shows up. Um, you can see clearly her sagittal alignment is far off because she has hypokyphosis where she should be kyphotic in her thoracic spine. Um, she is a Sanders 7. Um, she's only 53 degree curve. She's near, nearing being done uh, growing for this patient. We'll talk to them. We'll talk about their risk of continuing to progress. We can see them back in another year. Maybe it doesn't progress. Um, maybe this becomes uh, not a rapidly progressing curve, uh, or maybe they want to have surgery. There's no one that's skeletally mature or close to skeletally mature with a curve that's, you know, kind of just over this 50 degree mark that we're um, talking anyone into surgery. I, I, I will never talk any patient into surgery. These are not minor surgeries. Um, but as a conversation, uh, patient and family were interested in having this treated. Um, uh, you can see your bottom curve is flexible. Uh, fairly straightforward, classic surgery, got her some kyphosis back, got her uh, alignment better, dealt with the rib prominence and lined her up. Um, so that's tried and true here. So what are some things that maybe we're trying to do a little bit differently? This is a 12 year old athlete, much bigger curve in the way that she is so coronally shifted. Um, standard thoughts may be to 
Uh, certainly include L4 in this fusion because it's just so tilted off to the side. We do everything we can here to limit the amount of fusion, especially in athletes who really want to use their mobility. But anyone, you you need your mobility for the rest of your life. Um, so uh, not super new, but we'll use a lot of posterior column osteotomies in surgery where we cut the bone and try to really loosen it up as much as we can to get them to uh, shift back over. And, and in doing so, avoid um, having to come down stopping at L4 and, and being able to stop at L3. So newish, but um, you know, maybe more uh, particular to someone who does a lot of these surgeries um, uh, that, that we have some tools in our box to try to avoid um, that problem. What else do we do? Um, here or elsewhere. This is an example of a six-month progression, very rapidly progressing curve, something that clearly is going to get an MRI to, to um, monitor for us to figure out why it progressed. MRI is normal, just a really bad acting scoliosis. This girl came in with this 100-something 100, 100 degree curve um, right off of the track field. In order to get to this in a safe way, um, one thing that we can employ, employ is a uh, intraoperative traction. So we hang some weights off of their legs, put their head and their skull in a holder with some pins in it, uh, and really get them to be as straight as we can, safely, slowly throughout surgery to protect their spinal cord and then put in their screws and rods while we continue on. Um, so new-ish. New um, uh, also something that pretty particular to those that are doing this a lot, this is a 79 degree curve, just AIS older 17. Um, uh, she uh, came to us on her own. Her family uh, did not want her to have a surgery when she was uh, younger. Uh, and then as she became older and she was actually um, an independent teenager, she came to us herself and wanted a surgery. You can see here how stiff that chest is. Those ribs don't splay at all when we get this bending flexibility uh, radiograph. So I'm worried that those ribs are gonna be stiff and not let me um, expand the spine. And you can see that large rib prominence on the lateral. Um, and so we actually can go and cut the ribs just a bit. You can kind of see their outlines here. Um, so they cut them just a bit before we then correct the spine and it allows us to correct the spine better. Um, it's a adds risk, adds complications, something that we discuss with the family beforehand if, if they are, are interested in this. Uh, and you can see here how it really helps what otherwise would have been a really hard to correct thoracic prominence and rotation and how those ribs now look more symmetric to the other side. Um, and here, uh, this is might be your six month or one year follow-up. You can't even tell where those ribs have been cut because they just heal themselves back together in, this, in the new position. And then moving on to really big curve. Again, this is just an AIS spine. Um, this patient um, was lost a bit in the pandemic and um, once we uh, got her back in with some x-rays, lives, lives a few states away. Once we got her back in with some x-rays, this curve had reached, had gone from about 70 to 127. Um, this is certainly a curve that I'd be worried about just straightening out right away. So we have a really good halo gravity traction here where we can put these kids um, into a ring around their head with some weights off of their head in a pulley system with a walk or a wheelchair. She stayed here for a couple weeks. We slowly stretched out her spine and then went in and put in these rods. Um, she was outside playing basketball on her playground um, through it all. So she was an all-star. She did great. All right, going to spend some time now on this next newest thing because I think people might have some questions on this. Maybe not. Um, uh, but here is a 47 degree curve. So uh, she's RISER zero. Uh, she's 14 years old. So her skeletal maturity is a little lower than her age. Um, and she's got, a, she's got this curve that's not quite surgical, right? It's not quite 50 degrees, but if she's risen zero, she's still going to grow a lot. Um, what are we going to do? And the uh, kicker is she's a gymnast, so she really doesn't want a fusion. Um, so we could keep going with a brace, wait to see if this needs a fusion, um, or we can offer her a tether um, where we take this curve, um, you can see the intraoperative radiograph on the right, we tension it, and then when they stand, it loosens some. Um, we come through the chest with some cameras, we put these screws in and put a rope across the one side, tighten it as much as we can. Well, uh, tighten it to a particular amount and degree, depending on which level and their maturity and the curve size. 
Um, and then uh, the hope is that the bone itself growth modulates and so that bones that are wedged become wedged in the opposite direction as you capture their growth spurt. Um, and so this is a vertebral body tether. She still has it. She's doing fine. The indications for vertebral body tethering is a curve from 40 to 60 degrees. Sanders three or four we think is a sweet spot. Uh, and flexibility where they when they bend out to the side, it's got to bend out to less than 35 or 30. This is still an evolving technology, but the benefits are that you preserve a lot of your motion, that flexion extension. You lose side bending to one side where the tether is holding you. Um, there is a much smaller exposure, much faster recovery. You can return to sports in six weeks, since like contact sports instead of uh, you know, three to six months. So that's why people are coming and asking for it. Why not do it? Well, there's still a 25% reoperation rate, even in the best of circumstances. So this 40 to 60 degrees and Sanders three to four has taken us a lot of years to get to the point where we can say, these are our best indications for it. And even in these best indications for it, the reoperation rate is not small. The tether breaks, we guess wrong, we get the timing wrong, we tension it too much, we tension it too little. Um, so it's, uh, it's still a challenge, uh, but it's something that a lot of people, again, are interested in. There's a risk to injuring the lung and kidney now instead of risking, uh, you know, other things coming from uh, a posterior approach. And now the arguments are, well, maybe actually aren't saving that much mobility. That was the whole point of all of this, but nobody actually had studied the mobility until uh, more recently in live patients and compare them side to side. And what we know is that in the thoracic spine, putting in this tether, if you fuse down to T12 or L1, screws and rods, and you would do a tether down to T1, or, sorry, yeah, uh, T12 or L1, and then you have someone flex forward and try to touch their toes, there's no difference in their range of motion at that level. So where it's really saving you a lot is in the lumbar spine. Um, so much so that some people who were very early adopters of, of this vertebral body tethers and put them in all the thoracic spines uh, don't act, are standing on the podium right now and saying, I don't, I don't advise thoracic, um, thoracic tethers. We can get a much better three-dimensional correction with fusion, much less chance of going back to the operating room, and we're really not giving up that much uh, range of motion if we're staying uh, up high in a short level. So maybe that's better used in lumbar spine. This is uh, a younger kid. He's 10. Uh, his triradiates are open. He's quite short and his parents are quite tall. I think he's going to grow a lot. And this curve is already sizable. He has some sensory issues when he wears the brace. Um, so he's really not going to tolerate a brace at all. And we're in a tough spot right now. So at this point, do we do growing rods? Do we just fuse them? Do we say, well, we'll just wait longer. We'll try to use the brace again. Or do we maybe try to do a tether? If we were to do growing rods right now, we would have to use growing rods down to L4. So we're, again, we're really going to lock up a lot of his motion, but maybe we can cheat and do a tether and stop at L3. So that's what we did. We gave this kid a tether um, and we tried not to tighten it too much because he's going to be at risk for over tightening it and over straightening out because I think he has so much growth to do. So I think this is maybe a one year or a six month or a nine month follow up actually here. I'm not sure, but doing okay, no evidence that the tether is broken yet, and we're just waiting to see um, how we grow. So this is a little bit outside of the uh, indications given that he's uh, maybe a little young, but uh, I think lumbar spine and maybe some of these ones that are outside of the indications might be a more reasonable place to try to use this. And then kind of what's the newest thought with tethers? Well, this is a 60 degree curve, 60 degree curve. Uh, very standard, if you're going to treat this in surgery, you're going to fuse both of these curves. That's going to lock up a lot of motion, especially in the lumbar spine. So how about a hybrid approach where we fuse the thoracic spine, where we think you know, the fusion in the thoracic spine does great, you don't need to, uh, very low reoperation rate, um, doesn't lose that much motion. And for the lumbar spine, we try a tether and maybe we save locking up that lumbar spine. Um, and watch and see how it goes. Again, still not pure, pure indications. Jury's still out a little bit on these, but this is some other things that we're looking at and trying to trying to sort through here. Does anyone have um, questions on tethers? That's 
might be the newest thing that you're thinking about or hearing about? We had one question in the chat. It was um, early on when you got to this part, so I'm not exactly sure it's about tethers, but um, oh. one of our attendees was asking, what is the ideal age for a referral? So really for us, the ideal, it's less of an ideal age and it's more, um, what is the curve size? If if someone is one and they have a 35 degree curve, I want to see that kid, um, you know, I'm going to put that kid in Medicass, uh uh, and try to cure their scoliosis. I want to see them as soon as possible. If they, um, if they, you know, have a 20 degree curve at any point, we want to see them. We want to see them now if they have a 15 degree curve and they're young and um, we might want to brace them, whereas before we didn't want to. So really, if someone has a curve, we want to see them at any age. We're happy to, um, to see them. I know we've had some access is issues in the past uh we're working on that we have a i'll get to this but we have a new surgeon he's got all <laughs> wide open um clinics i'm uh opening up uh a clinic just one month in advance so that i can because uh, i know my clinics are really booked out late but at one clinic just new patients one month in advance where i can just fill those in with you know 20 new patients to make sure we have spots for the new patients we have a lot of PAs um, that are uh, trained up now that are seeing more spines, so trying to improve all the access for that. I don't know if that answers the question, but basically any 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 kid with a, sp a curve, we're happy to see them. All right, thank you. And then we had another question asking, how exactly is a tether performed? So a, a tether is placed um, surgically. They lie on their side, uh, and we use arthroscopic cameras if it's in the thoracic spine. Um, we use a couple small incisions with cameras. We insufflate like you would do, um, I don't know, any thor uh, thoracic surgery or, you know, like a GI surgery. We insufflate, uh, put air in the chest that drops the lung some while we hold the lung out of the way. Um, and then we put screws in the side through those holes into the front of the spine, into the vertebral body in the front. And then we literally put a rope across it and tension the rope, and then we leave a chest tube. If it's down in the lumbar spine, then we make an uh, oblique abdominal incision, or if we have to work on either side of the um, diaphragm, we may uh, camera the top, uh, scope the top, and open a small area at the bottom. Same thing, though, we're kind of coming into the retroperitoneal space, so everything gets pushed forwards. The, uh, stay in the, we don't see the gut, everything gets pushed forwards. We put in the screws on the side of the spine and put in a rope and tighten it. All right, thank you. That looks like all the questions for now. Great. All right. So um, I think the last kind of tried and true thought is, uh, and, and we may end this here early, but we'll try to take as many questions as people have, is that AIS is really simple and easy and, you know, we can send it to anyone, um, anyone they can get into first. There are a lot of people in the community that are um, treating idiopathic scoliosis, but if you're not doing it a lot, uh, and a lot is, um, you know, that the center is doing 100 of them plus a year, then I think you lose out on a lot of the nuanced aspects of it. You're not up on the research. You're not um, doing these new techniques that may or may not be offered to these patients. So, um, you know, there's a lot of people that Tether is not right for uh, um, that will come to me seeking a Tether. And we just talk about that. So there's a lot more to it, um, not the surgery part of it. The hardest part of all of this is just figuring out who needs a surgery and what surgery and how to talk about it. That's the hardest part. And I think you need to be uh, doing this a lot, seeing the evolution that's happening. And then when it comes to the surgery, if you only have one option, you're only going to offer them one option. If you don't have all of the tools in your box, then um, you may be missing out on an opportunity for a patient, perhaps. Um, so uh, these are our spine surgeons here. Uh, me, Bert Yaze, Scott Yang. Scott Yang is new here, but not new to surgery. He's actually um, has one year on me. Uh, he, we just got him here from OHSU. Um, so he has is a well-experienced spine surgeon here with us. Uh, we are all happy to see any patients, answer any questions you have, answer any emails. Um, and again, we're hopefully um, won't see as much of an issue on the 
uh, access point. If you come and asking for, uh, if some of these families ask specifically for a surgeon and they have a 15 degree curve, um, that that does become a challenge. Uh, we have very good mid-level providers who are very well trained to take care of um, some of these patients that aren't aren't as near to surgery or aren't as complicated. Or if they are, then they talk to us and, and send them our way. But um, sometimes it's easier to get in with those people quicker and, and have a faster screen. So um, hopefully we can uh, get there for everybody. But uh, always welcome to email, ask any questions, try to help answer them for you or um, someone has having trouble getting in, let me know. Um, uh, I do see a number of questions here, so I'll work through them now. Should we refer our patients when the comb angle is 15? Uh, yeah, I, I think there's, again, there's a little bit of nuance to it. If it's a 20 year old and they're 15 degrees, they're probably gonna be okay. Uh, but if they're still growing and they have a 15 degree curve, then um, yeah, we, we do wanna see them and um, assess should we be, um, should we talk about doing something for them, a brace or, or not? We uh, we would like to see those patients. Um, what is spinal asymmetry? Spinal asymmetry is a diagnosis given for any curve that's less than 10 degrees. So if you take an x-ray and you measure it and it's nine degrees, then it's technically not called scoliosis. Um, some of those diagnoses will get placed on patients' charts here before they get an x-ray taken before we know exactly what size they are. Um, so that's uh, that's the uh, difference between them. Um, uh, could you comment on straw physical therapy? Straw physical therapy, uh, that is, I'm sorry, I didn't include it in here. That's absolutely something uh, kind of a, it's becoming a bit of a tried and true. Um, it's a type of physical therapy where you focus on really using your muscles to hold open your curve almost in a way that a brace does. And so you work on strengthening those muscles and stretching them in a very particular way. It's a little bit intense to start. You have a, like eight sessions where you learn this all and then you come back quarterly. Um, it, it, we don't have any long-term studies on it. So the best studies show that maybe it prevent, prevents one degree of progression a year. I present it that if we want to feel like we're doing everything possible that we can, we also have Schroth. Um, particularly for patients who are not very physically active, uh, I will push it a little bit more. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing. It, it, it can't hurt. Um, it does take some time and investment from the family, and and there's a little bit of a setup cost setup to to have those things. Uh, like you have to buy some bars to hang off of and things like that. You can probably get them secondhand for cheaper. I think not. Uh, secondhand and maybe a hundred dollars. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, but it's something that we offer for anyone who's doing a brace. It is, uh, we have some people within Seattle Children's Physical Therapy that offer Schroth. There are other people in the community, as long as they are Schroth certified, they can do it. If they just say they do scoliosis PT, that is not Schroth um, PT. Um, and and it, there's an overwhelming interest in it. So our physical therapists and the studies really show it's best for small curves, young, flexible curves. And so our therapists try to center on that. If you're um, over a certain skeletal maturity or a certain curve size, um, you will be at the very end of the line to the point where they, they won't even put you in their line. Um, just working through the success rate of bracing. That all goes back to the brace study. If you wear the brace 18 hours a day, it's 90% successful for preventing, for avoiding surgery, but there's a very specific boxes that you can correlate all out. I would recommend you read that study. Stu Weinstein is the um, author, B-R-A-I-S-T study. Um, that's the acronym for it. And you can show all these different boxes. There's also one with from Jim Sanders that shows all the boxes based on the Sanders size. So like curve size and skeletal maturity and all going down and what's the percentage if you don't wear a brace, if you do wear a brace of going on to wearing surgery. So, or if you go, if you wear your brace, so very important to wear a brace, um, very, uh, shown very well to help prevent progression. It's the best single best tool, um, that we have. Uh, what's the best screening tool? Join late. We talked about screening. We talked about, um, uh, the scoliometer and that de it depends on their, uh, body habitus. A uh, curve uh, scoliometer reading over five or seven is definitely someone that should come to us. 
Um, that's going to mean that their curve is at least 20 degrees. If they have a larger body habitus, then maybe a smaller degree is someone that should be, uh, that is a, sc a positive screen. That's uh, the best thing we have on the atoms for a bend test at this point. Does the tether stay in place or does it eventually need to be replaced with growth? It just stays. Yeah, you don't um, change it with growth. It does eventually break. Probably somewhere between two and four years is the best thought that we have. Um, and so you just hope that you've corrected enough and gotten that growth potential back in time um, during that, that time period. A patient asking for a chiropractor. Do they have a role for 